Hello everyone, thank you for being here. My name is Michan Stojka, I'm a character to deal with side effects software. And in today's short masterclass, we'll be having a look at retargeting using the KinFX toolset. Now, this topic has been covered quite a few times in the past uh, by us or other users. Um, and the only real difference that this video will impose on the rest is the fact that we will be, one, of course, using the new Houdini 19.5 which will uh, showcase a few other uh, extra features that we added. But the most important bit here is that this will be straight, like strictly aimed at beginners. So if you haven't opened Houdini before, or you have opened it only a few times, uh, this will be a great video for you to get started because we will go through the actual retargeting workflow step by step. We won't dive into much detail in terms of like the actual intricacies um, of what's happening under the hood. We'll be strictly looking at nodes, how we can interact with them in order to achieve our goal. And the result of this whole masterclass will be an FPX animation, uh, or rather an FPX character with an awesome animation retargeted onto it that we can then put into a game engine uh, once it's been looped correctly, so we can set it up for a state machine. So if you're a games person, this could be potentially even more um, useful for you. But keep in mind though, the workflow uh, is very similar for both film and games, or no matter what other projects you might do. So this would hopefully benefit uh, every beginner out there. That being said, we'll be going relatively quick, quickly through the nodes and only really like take a moment on the ones that uh, require a little bit more explanation. So let's jo go ahead and jump uh, straight in. So we have here our scene that I have already built. I didn't want to like stumble across uh, various like values and stuff like this and tweak them with you. I appreciate your time. So we're going to make this a little bit more quick uh, while having stuff pre-built. So we have here our first node here called basic retargeting. We can dive right in. And of course, the first thing you want to do when you want to retarget is bring in a character and an animation. So in this case, our character is Capybara here that we've modeled in-house and an animation of this skeleton, blue skeleton walking on a beam. Go back to the beginning. Um, these are both FPX files. Do keep in mind that if you have a different file format, um, you can still bring those in. Most likely we have support for a bunch of file formats. You can check them up online. Um, mocap import, a very quick tip for other motion capture file formats. But you can definitely find very easy online what information you might need about what file format you are currently working with. So once we've got our characters imported here and we are happy with them, of course, ideally you would go through uh, and examine them slightly just to make sure that they have no major issues in their skeletal hierarchy or deformations, if you haven't done that already. But there's no problem if you do encounter any issues along the way because we can always go back and fix that because of the procedural nature of the software. So once we have this stuff imported, the first step we want to do here is to match rig match pose is to want to match the green skeleton that we see on screen to the blue skeleton that we see here, or rather the other way around. The pose of the blue skeleton to the pose of the green skeleton, so that when they start, their initial pose is very similar, so that we start the retargeting from there and it plays out as much as possible the same. Now, quick tip, if your blue skeleton, so your animation does not have a T pose or an A pose, and it begins, let's say, like this directly. So there is no rest frame. What you can do is you can, if you have access to a rest frame in a separate file, you can have another FPX animation import, drop down a rig stash pose, connect them like this. And on the rig stash pose here, this will use the pose source here um, to set this rest pose that you need and then you can plug it like this as a rig match pose. But our, in our case, we do have our rest pose on frame one. And if you have a look at the rig match pose here, rest frame for source, use clip info. This is going to use automatically the data that has on, it is on the clip to figure out the first frame and use that as the rest. So we are covered. If you don't have it, that's how you do it. Rig match pose. We only see the green skeleton. Where is the blue skeleton? Hit enter in the viewport that fires the node's state. This will be a common theme across this masterclass. We're going to be using a lot of states to build our uh, our stuff. 
So we have a look here in the state and we see a blue skeleton and a grayed out green skeleton. This is because we are manipulating the blue skeleton as by default. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that this enable match bounds is on by default. You can use it. Um, you can also disable it in this case. Uh, it would work fine. You can go as far as trying to match the skeletons uh, like global scale, if you will. So the pelvis matches more correctly, scale them up a little bit using the parameters here. But because I want to keep this very simple, I'm not going to do that. Um, you don't always need to. It's a good idea to do so uh, just to make sure you avoid any issues down the line that you have to troubleshoot. But because I, I pretend to know what I'm doing, I'm going to skip that step. So how do we pose the skeleton? Well, very simply, you click on a joint, you get a handle, you rotate the handle, it rotates the skeleton. That's it. You just position this so that the blue skeleton is more or less in the same pose as the green skeleton. Now, of course, they have quite wild different legs, especially, but that won't affect the retargeting too much. The upper part is what was mainly different because remember, this starts like an T pose. This is more like an A pose. So here we just make sure we turn the blue from a T to an A pose. Once that's taken care of, we can proceed. Next um, step is we want to map the blue skeleton to the green skeleton. So map points is in the name. Drop down the node. We don't do anything to it. Click enter in the viewport. And you see this picture right here. So I'm going to actually drop a new node for this one just because I want to get it to uh, the default first. So I click enter. This is what we get. So they look overlapping. That's the first difference. If you want to offset them, that's not going to actually change the position of the joints. It's just in the viewport it will. And this is strictly so that we can have some space between the joints when we map them. Just convenience, nothing else. So I just set this to one. It's basically a simple translation. Then away from the parameters to map, you click and then you have to click again. And that's basically it. There are a few options for automatic mapping on the node that you can play with. For this example, we're just happy to do it ourselves because we know exactly what we're doing. And it's an easy and quick step because we don't have a lot of joints. So we basically end up going through this process for all the joints in the skeleton. Um, again, we don't have a lot of joints in the blue skeleton, which is great. If you have a lot of them, like twist joints and whatnot, those you would want to probably leave unmapped because the solver takes care of the uh, actual uh, unmapped joints as well automatically. The more mappings you have, the more error prone the solve becomes. So keep that in mind. Always go back to your mapping and make it more sparse if the animation looks a bit too uh, like clay-like or a bit too unstable. Next, full body AK, the actual solver. We drop it down and that's pretty much as, about as, uh, as much as you have to do here. Once that's done, we can go ahead and play the animation and have a look at our capybara performing this beam walk animation. So we see a bit of jitters. There's a bit of jitter in that head, uh, a bit of jitter in the torso there, right there. The head goes a bit crazy right there. Um, besides that, looks acceptable. So very floaty feet as well that we don't like. So it's not terrible, it's a pretty decent first result, but we can do better and we will do better in this next step. So I'm gonna go out of this container just for convenience and go to the next container and explain what I did different here. So first things first, when you're looking and analyzing an actual, uh, let me display this again. When you're analyzing a retargeting uh, result, you want to look out for all these issues and try to isolate them and basically just uh, pinpoint where they come from, right? So in our example, this torso jittering that you see here, this is a retargeting issue and has to do with the amount of iterations that we allowed to solve, uh, which I'll explain in a second is legitimately one number. So that's easy. Uh, but then the head, this right here is actually a problem with our source. So how do you know that? Well, we can drop down the visualize rig, display our source here. And let's set this to like five or something just so we can see the joints. And if we look at the head joint, so that one right there, you see how it flips like crazy. Well, not really like crazy, but it kind of goes a bit orientation wise. Whereas the torso stays relatively as we would expect. So that means the torso itself is not problematic. Just the head is a bit uh, noisy. 
Um, so that means that when we want to fix this on the retarget, we're going to look at the head uh, to fix it in the motion directly in the source and at the torso in the retarget. So that's a very simple sort of uh, two cents there. So come back to the retargeting cleanup and how do we fix the, the motion? Well, as I said before, it's a bit of a noisy uh, issue with the head. So we've got this new smooth motion node, that's a Houdini 19.5 node, and we can drop this node down. If you press S in the state, select the head, S again, that selects just the head, we exit the state, we've got a few options down here. If you want to, um, to play with them and make sure we don't, uh, and we basically smooth out that that animation. Now this blend section you can ignore. I only did this because I wanted to make sure you only uh, like smooth out the head within the frames that it's problematic to not affect the rest of the animation. Is this necessary? Not necessarily. It might be if you want to preserve the rest of the timeline untouched and just use or just smooth out a particular portion. That's how you do it. But don't don't worry about it too much. So smooth motion for the head. Uh, we can go ahead and check to see if that fixed it. So we can have a look here and you see the head is still rotating a bit, but much, much better than it was before. So if we're not happy with it, we can increase the, uh, the values here. However, I am happy with this. I'm going to leave it like this. Then for the jitters, haven't done anything to these two nodes. The only node that you want to interact with is the full body AK. And remember what I said before, we didn't, haven't given the solver enough iterations. There's a parameter called iterations, so you guessed it, right? Crank this up to, I don't know, 50, 60 um, from 10. The more iterations you have, the slower the solve will be, but potentially the more accurate. So you can try and just experiment from 10 to like, I don't know, go to 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 60, and so on, until you find that sweet spot where it's basically just enough to eliminate most of the jittering. And I also uh, decreased the damping just a little bit for that extra bit of stability. You can read up on these parameters. It's really no big deal. This kind of these two is your, your com combination when you want to mess with these types of uh, fixes. And then before moving on, another little trick I can give you here is the floaty feet. So you notice that in this example, in this geometry container, the feet, though still floaty, are not as bad as here. You see how they float here, and you see how they float here. Well, why is that? Because the solver also gives us an option down here under, uh, under configure, under configurations, to specify a set of joints, in this case, left foot and right foot, that we want to increase the weight for. So this tells the solver, I'm more interested in the foot joints for this particular animation than the rest, so please accord extra weight or extra importance to them as you are solving. Since this is a biped walk, of course this makes sense because these are the contact points and we want them to be as close matching as possible. So we can go ahead and do this. You can do this for any joints. I wouldn't mess too much with that weight or add too many because it can get quite clunky and difficult to keep track of. But adding this for the feet for any type of biped or even quadruped walk is quite of a go-to to any retargeting process. Once that's done, we can have another, another look at the whole clip. And we see it's much more stable. No problems with the head, no to like crazy jitters with the torso. Everything seems to be quite all right. We can proceed now to the next step, which is isolating a clip of this whole motion that we want to then loop and send to the engine. So here, these magic numbers here are just something that you do. I'm sorry, that I did uh, beforehand by just looking at this animation, scrubbing the timeline, letting it play out, and just choose a range that looks like it could be loopable. So 104 to 245 is the magic sequence of frames that I picked. You can of course pick any what you wish, uh, as long as as short as you need to be. Next, extract loop clip. So once we know exactly the amount of frames that we wish to extract, we're gonna go ahead and do so using the, the, the magic motion clip nodes. So two words while they load what a motion clip node is. A motion clip is basically, it's going to take your animation across all the, the frame range that you see down at the bottom. So we have these 600 frames here. Animation is like about 400 frames long or something like this. And it's going to 
<clears throat> build something like this out of it. What is this? For each frame, you have a pose of geometry. So this turns your motion data into geometry. This is absolutely incredible. There are so many things you can do to manipulate this range once it is geometry. So this is a very powerful um, set of nodes that you can experiment with further. For this particular example, what we need it for is we want to trim. So we want to cut a piece of it and then um, loop it basically. So how we do that, motion clip cycle is a good start. So this is mainly for looping, but we can also use it for cutting at the same time. To do that, you have this motion clip cycle node. And I'll actually walk you through the parameters very quickly here. Uh, we can also fire the state of it to visualize what we've been or what we've uh, cut and uh, cycled as we manipulate the parameters. So I'll exit for now. There are a few things to keep in mind here. Uh, you can read up on this node. I'm not going to stay too long on it, but frame range. So this tells um, the node which range we want to cycle by just specifying a subset of frames. So in, remember what I said before, 104 to 245, we essentially cut the rest of the frames out of the clip, which is exactly what we want. So we get two functionalities in a single node. Perfect. Cycles after set this to one. We only want to loop one cycle afterwards because we're only really interested in those last frames to loop it back at the start. We're going to use locomotion for the cycling because we want to cycle to continue going forward instead of like cutting and then going back at the beginning. So this is very simple. We just set this to compute locomotion and select as a locomotion joint this uh, C. Uh, COG, which is the one that has the actual motion in space. Then under translation here, want to match the locomotion joint, uh, put the shift axis, just leave them to default. We want to leave some animation on the Y because why not? And under blend, we can play with how we blend um, from the initial clip to the loopable one. So this is set to blend over five frames. Again, Experiment with this, read up on the documentation. This is where you have to look for it. So that's the important thing to note um, in order to get this smooth, like correct blend between the clips. So it looks correct and it looks nice. Um, once that's done, next note, motion clip retime. This just allows us to basically take the, uh, the samples or the clip that we just cycled and move it over to start at frame one and end at frame um, whatever the frame was. So what this actually means is one playback start. So move all of our animation at frame one and animation end 246. So we don't want to be preserving the clips here. Remember we've selected a single subset, but then looped it once. We don't want it to be that long because there's no point, right? Since we're looping it, we're blending between it and then looping it. We only want to get the begin and that all the way up to the loop. So how we do that, because this starts at 104 and goes to 245 and then some more basically double that we want to here like kill it at 246 because remember it starts at 104, 104 and goes until 245 so we want to say cut it at 246 so basically when it ends the first cycle and then play put it all the way back at the start so it starts at frame one it's a bit confusing maybe, but keep this in mind. Motion clip cycle to cut the clip and loop it. And then motion clip retime to get rid of, just keep the actual for initial clip with that blended section at the end, right? Because we just, if you blend from clip one to clip two, then you get that nice blend between them. So now we cut again, we just get the first clip with that nice blend at the end that blends back at the beginning of the clip. And we put this at frame one, so it starts as what you would expect a clip to start. And then we can visualize our result using a motion clip evaluate with a joint deform. Play this, see it started at frame one, and it's going to go down until frame 200 and actually 100 and something, right? Because we've cut that just that first clip, 145, 43, there you go. So you can set this, uh, sorry frame range 143, so it just stops there and then it loops back again. You see we've got this just nice section. We like how the retargeting turned out and you see that the locomotion blends nicely forward so we don't get any kind of issues with the 
maybe a bit of a drift right there, but it's okay. Okay, we've isolated the clip. Now let's move on to the next step, which is cleanup. So you can do a lot with, with cleanup. Ideally, you know, the less you have to do or the less you do, the better the animation will look because the more you intervene and you muddy the mocap, the less point is in using the mocap. But there are some things that you will want to do most likely, mo like most of the time. So what I have here is I'm bringing in the motion clip here <coughs> uh, that we've outputted before. You can also bring in the motion clip evaluate directly, but we have a motion clip evaluate here to just allow us to play the motion, the clip. And what we want to address in this step is lock the feet correctly so they stay nice and planted. And then also a bit of some... Um, FK tweaking and a realistic shoulder solve just for the, the fun and giggles really. And not, not super necessary just to show it can be done and how. So how do we stabilize aka lock the feet? We have a node for this called stabilize joints. So you can drop down this node right after the motion clip actually. I can show you the, this from the beginning because it might be an interesting and worth thing to showcase. So you enter the state, you see everything is grayed out, the same pattern, press S, select foot and right foot, S again. This will only select these joints. Now we have a couple of automatic options on the node that I don't really want to use for this particular setup, so I can just go ahead and disable that. And now if you play, we see the animation without anything changed. To change something, what you need to do is you click on a joint, right click and you do start lock, for example. And this will lock this joint in place. And then we go through the motion. You can scroll down here to see. Come all the way somewhere here. And then you can do end lock. To stop that lock. Okay. So right click start lock. Right click end lock. And this turns the joint red, which means the joint can no longer move between those frames that we just selected and will stay exactly where it was before. Now you see that the feet are still, the, the fingers are still moving, which kind of creates a weird illusion. If you should just turn up the children transforms on here, that will prevent that from happening. And now they all stay put. You see that's locked and then it's going to blend out of that lock and so on and so forth. So I can show you what I did here in this state. You see how it, that's locked and you see this um, white version of the skeleton moving that represents the original animation, right? So the, how the original was and the green one with the red is how we've locked it. So you see here as we've basically locked, we don't allow the foot to float that much and then we nicely blend out of it on step. So here we blend out of it, we lock the other one and then we keep going down this cycle it's a fairly short cycle, so we might as well just lock everything by hand and have full control over what's going on. And once we're happy with this, we can go ahead and exit the state, and that's it. We've now locked our feet. Now keep in mind that if you lock that foot like that, it's going to lock it in world position. So the it might actually break your hierarchy, because we're not really solving this back onto the foot. We need an IK for that, so we're going to do that next, down here where we just apply a simple IK. To do that, IK chains, you select here the root mid. So root, I'll go ahead and show you really quickly. Uh, for the root, we've selected the right tie here. For the mid, the cuff, so the knee. And for the tip, the actual foot itself. And then we just match by name, and that will create an IK chain for that particular leg. That we then connect for driver, the stabilized joint result and for the skeleton, the actual skeleton that comes from Motion Clip Evaluate. So while it's all of this stuff, you might wonder in between. So skeleton blend, I just did this so we get a little bit of that original motion, original wiggle still passed back to the stabilization because it was a bit too stiff. This is again, you can experiment with this, uh, play with it. I'm not gonna go into much detail. It's not really part of the workflow. It's just a nice little trick you can do. So look here at stabilization how it stays completely static with skeleton blend. Look at it again, you see how it 
slightly moves right that right foot right there just a little bit and since this is like kind of a balancing walk i think it makes sense to have the ankles uh, wiggle a little bit not be completely static and then this rig pose what it's doing is it just shifts the uh the right calf so the the knee a little bit forward just to help the ik solve um with where the knee should be pointed so once that's done, we can check it in the IK chains and we see that the feet are way, way more stable. So look at that, foot down and it basically barely moves until you go back up. Look at that, great, okay. Okay, we've stabilized our feet, we're happy with the result, we can then move on. What's there left to do? Well, there's a bit more stuff we can do with feet stabilization, more advanced like foot rolls and stuff we could add. There's a few videos on this uh, online. I'm not going to go into that in here because it's not necessarily a beginner friendly step. It could be, but there is, there's no time for it now. So we're going to jump straight to the next one, which is this rig pose. Uh, that just poses the arms a little bit higher. Nothing really too fancy. Just uh, do some FK posing on the arms to correct some of that uh, height. So it's not really animated at all. It's just an offset. So it's like a constant offset. Um, I can show you here, you see how they basically just get rotated a bit. So they are a bit more leveled and go a bit higher. And then last but not least, before uh, actually exporting, what we could do also is the clavicle. So we see here that the arms are sort of lifted up a consistent amount and the clavicles remain. It, it doesn't look bad at all, like it looks quite convincing if you ask me. But we can do something a bit more like this, where we also leave the clavicles a bit more natural with the arms. And this is especially nice in these particular poses, where this is how you would look, right, with the arms almost like a T-pose. And then if we leave the clavicles, you also get this nice uh, geometry stretch right here as well. And how you would do this, this is something using something called realistic shoulder. So for this, I am going to set it up myself, just because it's going to be a bit easier to understand. So rig at Vop. It's a quite powerful tool, a bit more on the advanced side, but if you just follow me with these particular steps, then hopefully it will make some sense. We connect two, two things to it. So one is our animation that we want to modify, and one is this, which goes all the way up here, represents the animated pose as it was at the beginning, because we need a rest pose. We go inside here, fire the state, and then we can go ahead and drop down a realistic shoulder, node so this is the node it's just a different context but it's it works very similarly at least as far as you need to know um and then we have a look at what it asks for us so it says clavicle shoulder elbow and hand point so let's go ahead and do that we can have here a clavicle let's disable the output clavicle bring it in shoulder bring it in elbow bring it in and hand bring it in so we bring the points in and then we can connect the points here, the blue to blue. Connect them all of that. They all get connected once here and then we can set these to active. We're fine with that. And then here is the result. Propagate rotation, crank this up to something higher, like this value, and you see how the hand gets higher. So in this case, it is getting applied on the full um, so you see there's a difference, that's what I'm trying to make. Where this is obviously going much higher, this is sort of staying the same, it's just lifting the clavicle. So why is this? It's because the node has built in an IK solve, which most of the times you want. In this particular scenario, we can turn this active off and just do a set point transform and basically just say, you know what, I only want to in the clavicle. I only want to be affecting the clavicle, I'm not interested in anything else. And boom, there you go. This is basically the same as with this one, except the value is slightly different. So again, this might be a bit too much, a bit out of the scope of this lesson. It is good for you to know that this exists and that there's this whole concept that has a bunch of uh, nice tools that can even help like with cleanup or just solvers and so on and so forth. A realistic shoulder is a good one to remember because when you retarget, especially if your motion doesn't have clavicles or the motion uh, with it, it's not really uh, spot on. 
then this node provides a nice solution for automatically getting some of that clavicle movement as you're lifting the arm, which can really, 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 really make the animation much, much nicer. Okay, that out of the way, we can play this again and see if we like it. It looks quite nice. We've got these nice bent arms because we this this ripples here to modify them just a little bit so they look a bit more natural. The steps are quite nice and tight. Not much floatiness. Uh, the clavicles get lifted quite high, so we are happy with this result. We can then proceed to the last step of this video, which is export. Now, this is very simple here. What I have is I've also applied these textures on the capybara, just so we can see it more of a finished look. And what I have here is I decided to actually remove that capybara um, joint down here. So this joint right here, I decided to get rid of it because I thought, you know what, we don't actually need it in the engine, we already have a root, so might as well get rid of it. So delete joints, you can drop it down, go into the state, and you can just select that joint and hit delete. So if I do restore here, I can select this joint, I can even hit delete in here, uh, and that deletes the joint. Okay, so we get rid of it, very simple. We do the same on this side as well, so it's exactly the same. And then this FPX character output outputs our character. Uh, we output it again because we've removed this joint here. And then on this side, we bring in the result of our motion. So what we just worked on so hard, here it is, playing um, and hopefully looping correctly. And to check the looping, we have this nice extract locomotion node here. So if we drop that down, you see the result here. This will is basically used here to put the motion at the origin because since we'll be sending this to the engine, we don't want any actual motion on the character, on a world motion, like world space motion. We just want to have it at the origin and have it play on in place because we are gonna be driving it um, in the game directly. So how do we do this? Extract locomotion, select this C, uh, COG node that we also selected when we cycled. So it's the same, exactly the same idea, the same principle. And that converts it to in place. Uh, attribute delete here, we're just removing some attributes, don't have to worry about this, you don't even have to add this really. Uh, this is just for extra convenience and making it more clean. Deleting that the same capybara joint, now important, you notice that I'm actually deleting two joints here, because if you're looking in the rig tree, a new joint appeared, called locomotion. And this is because we have an extra locomotion node, and we don't want this joint to be part of our skeleton, so we select both of them and we remove both. <coughs> and that gives us the same skeleton as the one on the character that we just exported. And once we're happy with this, we can check the looping. So we can play it here. You can see it in place. Quite a nice balance to it. And then towards the end, we have to be very careful. You see we've got a bit of a frame here and here that are exactly identical. And this is because um, of course the last and first frame are similar, so we can set this to 142 so that the last frame of our animation is uh, the previous frame and that will make the looping a little bit more consistent. We can check it again. Okay, quite a seamless loop, can be better of course, spend more time if you are unhappy with the result, but for this particular masterclass I'm quite happy with how it turned out and we are ready to send this over to the engine. How do we do that? FPX character output, set a, uh, a file path and click save to disk, render the current frame. Uh, ROP FPX animation output, same thing, set a frame range, so we have here 243. Uh, you can do 143 or 42, you can check it out, we've just did 42, so let's change this here. And we can do a save to disk. And that will export and then we're done. So now I'm going to open Unreal Engine 5 and we will very quickly import this in engine and have a look at it right there to see if it imported correctly and if there's anything else we have to do. All right, so now we're on Unreal Engine. The only thing I have here is a simple scene, empty scene. I have built the material for our capybara and we've got characters and animation folders ready to go but are both empty. So for characters, we're going to right click and we're gonna go to import here. And under KineFX Retargeting, Export, we have our capybara.fpx. I'm gonna open this one. And we see if we're prompted with a few uh, options. So we want to import skeletal mesh, we want to import the mesh. That is all nice. 
uh, animation we don't want to import because we have none for this particular one. Convert scene, that's fine. Uh, we're not going to import the textures because we've already built the material, so we can just import all. Give it a moment. No smoothing group, that's okay. There is no multiple roots detected, so that's always nice. Um, okay, so we can go ahead and save these ones. Nice. Now let's open up and check our character. So we see the capybara got in correctly. Just to make sure that the hierarchy, the hierarchy got preserved and that it's uh, looking nice, which it is. So that's great. Um, let's just assign the material to it before anything else. So we have your material slots and I can just come here and select the ones, the one I've just built, which will apply the textures that we have for the capybara. And then we can save this asset and go out. So it looks good. Now let's just see if it's going to play the animations as we, as we expect it to. So you come here to the capybara beam walking FPX and click open. Uh, so now it's going to look for a skeleton that we want to use the capybara skeleton for, right? Because we already have the character, we just want to import the animation for it and apply it on the capybara. Everything else looks good, we're going to import and save just beforehand. And now, fingers crossed, we open and we see our capybara playing the animation. Seeing looping as well, which is a nice addition as we looked at 142. So okay, it looks pretty good. The looping could be worked on a, a bit more uh, for this sort of end, but overall it's quite smooth. We're not getting any popping, we're not getting any uh, like clear disruptions here. So overall, we're quite happy with this result. We can go ahead and, and save this again, just in case, and exit here. And now we basically have our character with the retargeted motion uh, all ready to go, and we can go ahead and build our state machine and loop it and do whatever other uh, things we want with it. And of course, we can keep going with the retargeting uh, in Houdini, because now we, that since we have the system in place, uh, it's very easy for us to just switch the incoming animation uh, target it again because we have all the values for the solver, for the FPAK solver. So target it again to the character and then maybe with the cleanup there's more tweaking that needs to be done uh, per motion because of course the motions differ and there's different bits that you want to, to clean up. So that would be uh, most of the things that I wanted to cover in this masterclass. Uh, I think takeaways are the less cleanup you do the better the animation will look. Try and uh, solve as many problems as you can in the retargeting step or before the full body IK rather. So in the retargeting workflow, the step, try and solve as many issues as you can because if you do that, then all of these issues that you solved once will easily transfer to all the other motions that you want to bring in and retarget onto the same character. The more specific cleanup, so the more like foot locking that we just did, which is a very specific for this clip or, you know, stuff like this you do, the more you're going to have to redo it for a different clip. A realistic shoulder doesn't really fit the bill because it's an automatic process, but even that one, you might not want to apply it everywhere. So try and solve as many problems as you possibly can in the retargeting step. Um, and that being said, hopefully this has been useful. Hopefully it's an easy to follow and it makes some type of sense even if you're coming from like a different DCC. We haven't been to Houdini uh, in the past. Hopefully this makes some sense and gives you enough of a, an intro into the retargeting that you can start right away and explore more in-depth um, material as you go along and as you actually end up needing it. Thank you very much for your attention and have a good one.